Hello everyone, welcome to Educanting. Today we are going to discuss about zoology, genetics and neuroscience. And for that discussion, today we have with us Dr. Aniket Bhattacharya. And Aniket is joining with us from USA. Aniket welcome to our show. Uh, thank you, Shubhaji. Thank you for having me. So to start the session, Aniket we will start our session with your story. Please share your journey with us. Okay. Um, so I I um, I was born and raised in in um, a small town called Shippur in Howrah, West Bengal, and I went to school in Howrah. It's my school is South and Center English Medium High School. It's in a place called Danishiklin, and then from there, I, so I did my ICC and ISC from uh, that school, and then I went to presidency for my BSc honors in zoology. Then uh, subsequently, I went. Um, then, then that was it for me in Kolkata, and then I moved out of Bengal and I went to uh, Banaras, uh, Banaras Hindu University, for doing my master's degree in zoology. Um, while doing my master's, I had uh, qualified the national eligibility test, the which is uh, which is conducted by CSIR UGC, uh, CSIR UGC Net, and then um, I started my PhD in a CSIR lab, CSIR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, right after my MSc. Back in 2012, I completed my PhD in 2000, March 2018. And after that, I moved to the US for my postdoc. And right now I am uh, in Rutgers University, New Jersey, and I work with uh, the genetics of autism. Oh, great, great. Uh... So, Aniketda, uh, if possible, can you share with us some interesting story or some interesting invention from your research, from your observations? Yeah, sure. Uh, I would, I would um, I'd like to start with my first paper, which is always uh, very special to everybody, I would say. Yeah. So we had this, uh, and it was very early on in my PhD. So I was also, um, it was also, uh, a great learning curve for me, like how to write a scientific paper. Um, so we were working on 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 this idea that if um, on 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 the function of skin as a barrier, and uh, so just to give you some uh, context to this, we already know that uh, the the as as we have evolved from uh, apes to human, great apes to human. One of the most remarkable features in 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 the evolution of humans has been the loss of body hair. I, I mean, we do have some body hair, but it's we do not have a fur, which which uh, is there in in our closest cousins. I would say like chimpanzee. So um, so this was a very interesting question in evolutionary biology as to when when did we lose body hair, and when did we then when did we start wearing clothes because these are correlated. If 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 you have lost body hair, then it is uh, we do not have the protection of the fur to give you the warmth, and then that's why you're compensating it with wearing clothes. So this was done by um, Mark Stone King, a very very well known evolutionary geneticist, and uh, he had done this by looking at how when did um, our head louse, the the louse that lives in our heads, has speciated into body louse. So when these these, these two species they had diverged so we took this like we, we thought okay the, the this so so definitely in the lineage leading to humans as we have evolved the skin has undergone multiple uh, processes of adaptation so the one part of it was pigmentation which which has been very widely studied we wanted to look at keratinization which uh, is another uh, function of the skin which is very important for loss to prevent loss of water so skin acts as the first layer of defense. It, it prevents evaporation of water from your body. So we looked at multiple different populations of, uh, of the world. And we saw that, okay, this is uh, keratinization of uh, is one such process which is under evolution. So it is actively evolving. As humans reside in multiple different places of earth, which differ in terms of their environment, like different places get different amounts of sunlight based on their latitude and longitude they have different humidity they have they experience different rainfall or different solar radiation so how the skin what what are the genetic changes that have undergone in the human populations which live in those areas 
and um, what 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 kind of changes have occurred through the period of evolution as, as they have adapted to the, that settings. So this was my first paper. And uh, if I can tell you a little bit about one of my postdoc work, so mm, I have moved a, like quite a bit. I in in my um, in in the areas in which I have worked. So uh, in my first postdoc, I was working with uh, heart development and heart diseases, cardiovascular diseases. So one such disease which is very prevalent is is uh, calcific aortic valve disease in which the valves of the heart which which uh, which regulate the blood flow out of the heart become stiff so they are not as pliable so so the that the only only way and it's very prevalent in in people who uh, who are uh, older so it it, it uh, age is a risk factor for that and the only available um, treatment is surgery which is very expensive not a lot of people will be able to sustain that surgery so we were trying to see if what kind of uh, pharma, uh, pharmacological uh, inhibitors or pharmacological treatments can be developed for for treating this condition and we came up with an excellent genetic uh, test in which if uh, if we reduce the dose of certain genes that that uh, contribute to that pathway uh, just by half so then we we can get significant improvements in 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 that condition so this was done done in ma mouse but then yeah it has tremendous potential for translation oh, great great so uh Anikita, from there i want to know one thing like you did bsc msc in geology then you take phd in genetic human genomics and night now you are doing postdoc in neuroscience so right. you and I, I am curious to know about like how and why you made these changes and how did you make this shift? And anyone from any anyone who want to make this shift, what are the opportunities they have? Um, so I had decided pretty early on in my career, like, well, I would say just maybe right up. Uh, not very sure on what and uh, what would be the specifics. But uh, so that I, I gave myself an opportunity to explore uh, different things before I settle on what, what I want to do. Um, while I was doing my master's degree in, in BHU, so they, uh, the, the MSc program in, the, uh, in zoology in BHU is particularly very rigorous and very um, thorough. And I took uh, for my special paper, I, I had molecular and human genetics. And, and we got uh, some very, very good teachers. Like uh, I had uh, Professor Lakotia, who's my teacher, uh, Dr. Uh, J.K. Roy, and um, Professor Raman, uh, very like uh, stalwarts of uh, uh, Drosophila and human genetics. So they were my teachers. So that's why I uh, I had grown a natural liking for, for uh, genetics. So, and, and it, it, it spoke to me in multiple different ways uh, because, um, it, it's a very universal language. If you understand the language of DNA, you are not restricted by what what species or what kind of organisms you you will be working on. You have a very vast palette to uh, to sort of at your disposal. So it, that that spoke to me, and also I, I um, ever since my ever since my BSc, I have very uh, I have been very interested in in the process of evolution in the forces that have shaped um, species as they are today, specifically human evolution. Uh, and um, if we talk about human faculties, one of the most developed faculties that we have is the brain. So it's, it's not just one organ, it is a composite of many, many organs together. They all have very specific functions, very, uh, which, which has all developed in a remarkable, in, in, a, in a relatively shorter span of evolutionary time. Um, so that was something I, I have been very interested in. And I wanted to, and I wanted to use genetics as a method to study it. So th that's why I took, uh, uh, it, it made more sense to, to do a PhD where I learned all the methods and then eventually uh, pursue my higher uh, or pursue my later research in in more uh, academic disciplines of neuro neuroscience. So for somebody who would um, who is willing or who who is willing to um, do genetics, 
I would say uh, it's it's very so today's biology is very interdisciplinary. It's it's not restricted like um, it, it 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 you cannot pigeonhole biology into like this is botany, this is zoology, this is physiology, or this is microbiology. It's very very uh, interdisciplinary, and uh, today's biology also has a lot of crosstalk with other branches of science. For example, it you if you are studying biology, you, you would need a very good understanding of chemistry, you would need a good understanding of physics sometimes, and particularly for genetics, also a lot of maths. So um, yes, so it, it, you should, uh, somebody who's willing to branch out into those uh, should, should have their basics, um, should have the foundation correct. And yes, uh, any, any new field that you move into is a new challenge but also um, a lot of new opportunities. And we should think about that, the point you mentioned, my interdisciplinary thing, so we should think sure. on that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. This is mm, this is something that I um, I think it's, it's, it's gradually changing in India because, you know, it, it's not always at the level of the curriculum or the syllabus, it's also about the mindset. Like what, what, what exactly uh, people think about certain things. So um, traditionally, when when I started, uh, I started my graduation. It was almost universally uh, thought that people who study biology are weak in maths. So that's why that. So that that is why they are forced to study biology because they cannot study any. Um, they they will not study anything that has got something to do with maths. But this cannot be further away from the truth because if you're uh, if you if you see the kind of work that I'm doing today or the work that I've done in my PhD, it, it's it's so much so much maths. Like if you uh, you are dealing with uh, a lots of um, you use a lot of functions of maths. If you're doing programming, particularly if you and today's biology uses a lot of programming, especially computational biology uses a lot of programming. You have to use a lot of statistics when when you do research. So unless you have a very good foundation in maths, all of this are going to be very, very difficult. Great point. And now, now I want to know about like the career, different types of career opportunity even if a student study in geology and uh, genome genetics. So what are the opportunities for studying like for MSc, PhD and uh, inside India, outside India? What are the opportunities for study in geology and genetics? So um, let me let me uh, break this up into so if if a student is studying zoology, there are of course traditional paths that have always been available that they can they can either go into academic research if they're pursuing a PhD, um, and uh, so with or without a PhD, they can also go for teaching, depending on what what is the level at which the student is interested to teach. Whether if it's a if it's college then a PhD would be advantageous. Um, if, it's a, if it's school, then maybe not, maybe just an MSc is fine. Um, there are also, so zoology is also um, an optional subject for both uh, UPSC as well as many state level civil service examinations. So I, I have had friends who have uh, been, uh, who have studied zoology and then they have taken these kind of exams and particularly um, uh, like you have to get into this uh, this um, IFS, it is Indian Forest Service. So if you have um, a, a BSc, their, their eligibility criteria is you should have a BSc in, in, in one of these biosciences, either it can be uh, botany or zoology or agriculture, and then you have to qualify the civil service examination. So that's uh, that's a possibility. Um, then if somebody is uh, interested in conservation efforts, because in, in zoology, you also have ecology and evolution that you study. So people who, uh, with a little bit of interest in conservation, um, they, they can apply to places like the Forest Research Institute, FRI, which is in, in Dehradun, also the Zoological Survey of India. They, they have made multiple regional offices, but the main center is in, in Kolkata. So uh, they, they, they have lots of opportunities for people who want to catalog different kinds of uh, different kinds of species, different kinds of insects, what 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 
uh, economic impact these uh, insects have on on human how uh, people come in conflict with wildlife and how those conflicts can be mitigated can be resolved so th these are some very good uh, opportunities for people in zoology uh, and i would say most of them will be applicable right after bsc some of them probably after msc um, for genetics again it's a very vast canvas you you can be you can do whatever with so mm -hmm. one important thing that is slowly coming up in india is the job of a genetic counselor somebody who would interpret the the result of a genetic test because genetic tests are uh, now increasingly being uh, becoming uh, common and they are being re recommended by by clinicians to aid diagnosis but um, to interpret some of these results because they, the the language of genetics is is slightly complicated so uh, you would need a mediator to interpret them so, so that um, people can make a conscious choice based on based on the results also there could be um, there are opportunities for doing clinical research there are opportunities for going into forensics uh, also lab technicians um, and and one thing that is i think that's across stem fields is people are now increasingly opting for careers of science writers illustrators uh, outreach professional who who take the science that uh, people like us do to a more uh, understandable version so that it it reaches a lot of people they they understand what 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 it is about and then they're excited about it and in in i i would say it's uh, if you if you are of course if you are in 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 a country like the united states or um, some of the european countries or the uk uh, then the opportunities are much more and uh, you can also like here it's 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 interdisciplinary from the very beginning so a lot of people take multiple courses together somebody who wants to do uh, patenting for scientific technologies they can uh, maybe they are doing a, a, a course in law and a course in biology parallelly and then they can they they choose that kind of a career so it's it's a little bit more flexible here than than it is in india although i am hopeful that uh, with with the recommendation of the new education policy that has come um, a couple of years ago if that is uh, that well if the if what is there in the text if that is brought into the classrooms it will be very good because then you are not pigeon holing people into into studying certain combinations of subjects so in in continuation of that we we get uh, lots of information about the job opportunity and all this so in continuation of that i want to know like suppose someone in their msc or bsc and he or she want to do some good internship or she want to explore the career different career opportunities through of in zoology zoology or genetics so what are the good opportunities like doing internship or project how they can approach and what are the good colleges they should approach please give some light on that so uh, i would talk about one particular program which is uh, like which is really nice and i have also been a recipient of that uh, fellowship it's the it's called summer research fellowship program and it's conducted jointly by the three national science academies of india the indian academy of sciences indian national science academy and uh, the national academy of sciences all three of them jointly do this the 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 so it it's 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 called summer research fellowship program but the program allows you to do two months of paid research in in a laboratory and uh, this is available to both students who are pursuing uh, bsc or msc or uh, btech mtech degrees as well as teachers who are teaching in school so that they can upskill themselves um i think the monthly stipend is around 12000 rupees and they also pay you your train fare for um, like onward and return journey from from the place and all like multiple fellows of these three uh, national science academies whoever has agreed to host a visitor that uh, that summer will will uh, be listed and then the individual can pick one uh, one or like they will have to i think 
order, give an order of like three or four scientists that they are in, in the order in which they would prefer to work. And if there is a, a match, then, then they are selected. It's, it's competitive uh, because a lot of people apply and um, there are only limited seats. But it, it's it's a very nice opportunity. It's a very nice opportunity for somebody uh, to to actually get a feeling of what, especially for people who want to do a PhD or who want to do uh, research later on, even beyond their MSc. It is very important to know how a lab functions or what what kind of what what research looks like on a day to day basis. And then maybe they think that, okay, this is something they really like. Yes. If they think, no, this is very stressful for them, or this is not something that they enjoy doing, then I think it's it's uh, it's a good call not to not to get into uh, that kind of uh, situation. We, we can always, we, we, we can um, always talk about like how this can lead to what kind of mental health you will uh, mental health issues uh, you can mitigate in in your uh, um, in your PhD or later in your research career, but this is something that's very important. There's also a summer research fellowship program that is um, that's sponsored by JNCSR, Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced uh, Scientific Research in Bangalore. They also um, so uh, these these individuals can be either. They can work with some scientists in JNCSR, or they can also choose other scientists to work with. They also get a two-month fellowship, which is, I think, ten thousand, around ten thousand rupees, um, and then um, they can work with um, some scientists. There are also U.S.-India collaborations, which are a little more competitive. Though fellowships, there's a Fulbright program in which either students can come to the U.S. to do a do their masters or people who are doing their PhD can spend a year of their PhD in the US in a host lab learning something that they could not possibly do in India. And these will all be paid. These are paid uh, fellowships. So uh, very good opportunities. And I want to highlight one more point you just mentioned, like before going, before jumping into the PIPR of PhD or research, Please have a taste of that during your BSc or MSc. Sure. Please have some project and think that if you it is possible for you to continue this thing for five years. So that is a great right. point you mentioned. Yeah. Right, right. Because a lot of, um, unfortunately, in many colleges in India or many institutes in India, they do not really have, like the, the MSc lab courses or the BSc lab courses do not reflect the rigor of a research lab. So uh, there is a and and it's it's the fundamental uh, there are fundamental differences between these two uh, these two curricula or any curricula versus PhD because if you're if you're doing your BSc or MSc or even MPhil for example where you have just where you have a thesis you are you know that this is particularly in in academic courses you know this is the syllabus this is the course this is what is taught this is what I would be evaluated on. But when you are doing a PhD, in ideal case, you should you should be doing something which nobody else has done. So uh, it, it's very challenging. So you are in charge of a lot of things. Like you, you, you do not have the safety net of, I will only do this much and it's done. You do not know how much you have to do. And whether, and of course, if you're trying something new, you are bound to fail multiple times before you finally succeed. So uh, that that tenacity that uh, is is very very important, and and to know if you would enjoy it because it's it's a significant portion uh, of your life. Because if you think of it um, just in terms of say an, an average individual's lifespan is like seventy years or seventy five years. If you think five years of PhD is one fourteenth of your life or one fifteenth of your life, so you don't want to spend uh, like that significant portion of your life being sad and complaining. You want to be happy through it. And if you get a PhD which is not very, uh, which which doesn't do justice to the degree, then you have a degree like you you will be called a PhD, 
but then you're not eligible for a lot of other, or you will not be competitive for a lot of other jobs that will be offered post post PhD because you do not you have not acquired that skill set. So that's that that's not really a great idea. Yeah. So uh, Aniket, the very good point, and in continuation of that, like uh, recently, mental health for the PhD student is a very concerning situation. Like in India, we saw that in different, mainly the premier institute, IIT, ISI, and these are the institute where the suicide rate is very high for the PhD students. True, so that's very hmm. What do you think? What do you think? Like uh, how to tackle this mental health? Uh, what should be the mindset of a student when he or she going to the PhD? What, what is your observation from your point? Well, Shubhaji, there are two two sides to this. Uh, one is, uh, before, before uh, talking about what the students can do on their part, we also have to acknowledge what the infrastructure or what the institutions can do on their part. Uh, first of all, there is very intense competition for getting into these institutes. That takes a toll on people. For an, 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 because you you know um, like if you give just take the number of applicants for any of these fellowships or any of these entrance exams and the number of people who finally get into the program this is a like it, it's a huge disparity um, and then um, it's so there are issues which are um, there are certain uh, like certain. Uh, bureaucratic issues where you do not have access to some um, facilities i would say like you if you want to use a microscope you have to it's you have to get through a long line of red tapes before you can finally get to use the get to use the instrument that you want or um, there are problems with dispersal of fellowships um that's uh, that's that's been a like that's been an issue that we have been we have had even uh, before I had started, like um, there, there are problems with irregular dispersal of fellowship. So how is that person going to continue if they do not receive, they will, they will receive it after six months, but how are they going to spend those six months or one year without fellowship? So they might have to uh, ask from their uh, parents or, or, and not everybody's family is, is at, at, at that uh, uh, level of affluence where they can support or maybe they they may not even they they may not even want to ask their uh, ask somebody else for help. So that's one point. And also, um, uh, your supervisor that could be that could be that could be a, a major point. And while while there are, there are some people who are not very sensitive to um, why why like what is their responsibility as a supervisor as a mentor of a PhD student. Uh, sometimes there is a mismatch in expectation, like what what the supervisor, the kind of um, work the supervisor wants and the kind of work a student is willing to put in. And there could also be also be um, a little bit of dissolution about uh, why a PhD, why a student is doing a PhD. So on the part of the student, so some of these administrative or infrastructural or bureaucratic issues we have no control over like we we can always protest against them but that on on a on a direct basis we cannot control them but um, the the mismatch in expectation can be controlled for example i would always recommend that anybody before going into a phd program should ask themselves why do i want to do a phd like what what is the purpose of doing this phd uh, do you want to get into um, get into a company after this do you want to teach after this uh, is phd necessary for doing that because you are you are investing a significant amount of your time um, and why so if you are really really convinced by your answer you should be convinced that yes it is worth doing a phd then then do it then then it also so if if, the, if you have a convincing answer at the very beginning, you can always go back to that answer in your moments of uncertainty. When you feel, okay, why am I doing this? You always can go back, okay, this is, this is the reason I started. This is the reason I'm going into it. For a lot of things, you may not need a PhD. So you may not have to do it. Like it, it's, it's not just a fancy degree. It's there, there is a, there is a method to it. 
So I, this is something that I have learned from my supervisor. And uh, believe me, when she asked me this question when I was interviewing with her, it, it's it's very daunting. It's because we are we are not used to thinking like that. Like, why do I want? You think of PhD as a natural culmination of your MSc. If you're doing, if you're good in studies, if you're academic, if you have an academic bend of mind, you think it's a natural progression. You you automatically do a PhD after doing your MSc. That is not the case. You really should know why you want to do a PhD, and if you have an answer to that that really clarifies what kind of a career you are thinking about yourself. Because the time when a person starts a PhD is around like 22, 23. They are mature enough to think about what they want, uh, in, in which direction they want to pivot their career. That's, that's really very important. And choose a good supervisor, I would say. So internships might be a very good way to also map, also to see that, okay, what kind, if, if, if this is a person I'm working with, do I like their style of working? Do 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 I think they we are a good match in terms of uh, because if you if you are not happy with that person in two months, very unlikely you will be happy with them in five years. So so then you know okay these are and and you might also develop a set of questions for yourself that okay this is something when when I meet my potential PhD advisor or postdoc advisor. I would be asking these questions that do you what do you think about this and then if we see that we our answers match or we i can live with some things i i this is something that is totally not negotiable uh, for me then you can choose the person accordingly that's that's going to be very important i will give you an example for for me when i i started my postdoc i wanted to work with a person who's not very um, strict about lab timings like what time you come into the lab and what time you leave. Um, some people are, some people are not. A lot of people in India are. And I, I think it, it's, so I don't subscribe to that idea that you have a specific in time and out time. Uh, my current lab, my current PI, um, Chiara Manzini, uh, she is totally like you You work at whatever time. And, 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 uh, one of the things that COVID has shown us is people can work from wherever and at whatever time and still get things done. So you don't really have to tell them to come to the lab and stay in the lab for whatever amount of time and then think the work is getting done. So if if a student is not somebody who, who wants to come to the lab at 9.30 and the supervisor is somebody who really, really expects that, then that's that's a conflict right there. Great, great. Very, very, uh, very good points you have mentioned. Thank you. Thanks for these points.